Wonderful. I'm short and a little square, so I need to make sure the mic actually reaches where I am. So this is good. Can you all hear me in the back? Good? All right. Um, hi, I'm really excited to give this talk. Uh, I've always wanted to come to this conference more. Is it good? Yes, great. <laughs> Um, I've always wanted to come to this conference, and um, it is unfortunately located just before U.S. election season, and so I've never had an opportunity to actually fly the coop and make it out here, and I want to tell you all, this is an amazing thing. Oh, sorry, closer, better. Um, it's an amazing thing. This conference has been absolutely wonderful. I can't even tell you how great this is. Um, so what I want to talk to you all about a little bit today is about data visualization and empathy, uh, about connecting with the dots, the people who are behind the data visualizations that we do. So the first thing you'll want to know is you will need me to establish some bona fides. Who is this guy? So I work at the Washington Post um, uh, just since this last April. Um, it's a, a, my hometown daily, um, you know, a small newspaper. Um, <laughs> it's been publishing for a few years, you know, on things of like local importance um, to residents in the Washington DC area, but certainly, you know, not really widespread. Um, uh, I work not with anybody like this, uh, although uh, these folks, this is, um, uh, these are the folks who wrote the Watergate stories, right? And so um, they were memorialized in, uh, in film uh, by much more handsome portrayals of themselves. <laughs> um, Robert Redford and Dustin Hoffman, who ironically were not in the Washington Post building. They, the movie was filmed at the Baltimore Sun because the Washington Post <laughs> told them they were not allowed to use the building. Um, so I don't look like Robert Redford uh, or Dustin Hoffman. I look like this. Um, uh, and this also does a pretty good job of explaining sort of how I feel when I work in a newsroom, right? Because uh, I'm a programmer. I'm something of a programmer myself. Um, not a particularly good one, um, but uh, I'm good enough to, to work in a newsroom. Uh, and so the sort of saying that we have uh, for the people who work on my team is that we'd be the best programmer in a room full of journalists and the best journalist in a room full of programmers. Um, <laughs> But we're <laughs> the way you frame it is really important. Um, uh, I also want you to know I'm going to violate basically every rule of a Monktoberfest talk. It's a weird title. Um, I'm not really a data viz professional, though I do manage teams that have data visualizers on them. Um, there's not a single slide that involves beer, uh, and I'm not entirely enamored with the city of Boston. Um, so. <laughs> so this is largely what I do. Uh, I work on election nights, and I work with live election data, right? Uh, and so I've worked at the New York Times, at the Washington Post, and NPR, um, uh, ways of like essentially telling the story of what's happening on an election night with the live election data that's coming in. And so um, you may have seen this project uh, that I worked on before, right? This is the needle at the New York Times, which was an attempt to summarize what we thought was happening in an election in more or less real time. Uh, my job was to get this thing on the internet and then to feed it with real data as the night progressed. Um, so I have to tell you, it's exciting that uh, I had to go on the record in my own publication defending this work uh, about why we might want to visualize uncertainty around uh, expected votes uh, projections. Um, my in sort of internal take on this is that if you're a weather forecaster and you have access to models about things like where hurricanes are or what temperature it is outside or whether or not it's going to rain, you don't hold those back from your readers just because there's uncertainty baked into them. You just tell your readers what the uncertainty is, then you go on and let them know what it is you think you know about the world that they don't know. Um, and so uh, in a broader sense, uh, my job is to kind of build a bridge between engineering and a newsroom, right? Newsrooms are old and a little stuffy and kind of conservative when it comes to technology. And so um, building that bridge is, uh, is uh, very exciting for me. Um, there are a lot of folks like me who work in like sort of liminal roles that, uh, you know, are between these two worlds. Uh, but there are way more people who are just either a traditional newsroom uh, employee or a traditional engineering employee. Um, I want to have a brief digression before we get started. Um, professionally, I'm really obsessed with this idea about exoskeletons, right? So this is uh, <laughs> this is uh, this is Ripley from Aliens, right? She's wearing an exoskeleton, uh, and I want to point out that I really like that there was an AI or a machine learning uh, deck earlier in the conference. That was a really wonderful presentation, and one of the reasons why I like it is because I hate the idea of replacing our journalists with robots. One of the idea, one of the reasons why I hate this is because humans are super good at various things, right? Uh, and so I love the idea of exoskeletons as opposed to robots. Uh, exoskeletons, critically, they help you do the things you already do just slightly better, rather than replace you with like uh, 
uh, you know, silicon brains. So this is what I want to do. I want to build software that helps reporters tackle their beats, right? I want to build software exoskeletons that make them better at the things they already do. So if they're analyzing Supreme Court or if they're taking a look at uh, national opioid statistics, I want to build software that helps them do all those things just slightly better, right? I don't want to replace them with any robots um, for reasons that we can discuss later. Um, and before I uh, even get in, I want to go ahead and pay some debts of gratitude. Uh, Lena Groger of ProPublica has given this exact talk probably much better than I did in previous years. Um, she is a data visualization professional. She's very good at it. Um, and she's behind some of the ideas that are in here. Jacob Harris, who I used to work with at the New York Times, uh, he's an alum, he's in healthcare now, um, wrote a really great article called Connecting with the Dots uh, that will be in the bibliography at the end. Uh, Scott Klein, who's an editor at ProPublica, had this idea that uh, people will get scooped uh, by folks who know how to use spreadsheets and data, and that got me really thinking about this. And finally, Alberto Cairo, who is a graphics professional at the University of Miami, uh, has almost all of the good visual things that are in the stack. So um, that's why I wanted, to, I wanted to go ahead and get this out of the way. So why are we going to talk about data visualization? Um, it's like the Nam Shub of Enkidu from the book Snow Crash, right? Data visualization hijacks your brain at a primitive level and shovels data in there before you even have an opportunity to work on it. Um, I want to tell you about why that's true, right? This is a little primer on... <laughs> At least I'm not talking fast, Norma. I could be talking fast. At least I'm talking slow. All right. Let's talk for a little minute about how... <laughs> how you're... <laughs> All right. We're not going back. We only go forward. Um, I want to talk to you for a minute about how your visual hardware works. You, Norma involved, Norma included, none of us are uh, multi-purpose machines. What you have in here is basically an ASIC that's pro programmed with a set of very specific behaviors and constraints. So here are two things. You are really bad at the thing on the left and really good at the thing on the right. Uh, if I ask you to find all the sixes in that pile of numbers, it's going to be really hard for you to do. Even though there's like good line spacing, the numbers are pretty far apart from each other, you are pretty good at telling the difference between a six and say a one when the two numbers are right next to each other. The problem with this is that um, when, you, when your ASIC has a pattern matching algorithm inside it, it doesn't do this at all, right? So you have to drop into a, you have to go into a higher level of abstraction. You have to write a piece of software that crawls over every single letter in this, and as everyone knows, loops are slow low, right? So what you needed is some way that you could drop down into a lower level of abstraction and go to work. You can do that with the sixes on this page, right? Because the sixes here are highlighted in a different color. Your brain is really good at color and shade. Your brain is really bad at distinguishing sixes from other numbers, right? So here's another example of this. Um, if I asked you to tell me how many of type one and type two there are in this, just give me an estimate, right? Is it Roughly equal? Is it, you know, uh, one is more than the other? It's basically impossible. You can't do it even if you, like, go through and count them on your fingers, right? But over here, you can do it almost instantly. All you have to do is blur your eyes, and you can tell there's about the same number. You can't, it's, you can't help yourself, right? This is happening at a way pre-conscious level. It's down there in your lizard brain. The parts of you that want, um, you know, General So's chicken are the same parts that are making decisions <laughs> about which one of these factories is more or less, right? So... Um, there are basically three things that your brain ASIC is good at. You are good at size, orientation, and color and shade. Anything that isn't one of these three things requires you to write software and loops and thus is very slow, right? So when we do data visualization, we are trying to work in these three areas in order to force the like lower level parts of your brain to like ingest information before you can even think about it. Um, the people who t write about this stuff call it precognitive because you don't even think about it. It's literally happening at a level before you can think. Um, and here's another great example of this, right? So uh, if I asked you to compare the length of these lines, you can do it. Uh, it's real easy for you to figure out which are the longest ones. But you can do other things with those lines other than just compare them. You can do quantitative analysis of them right here in your brain. You can tell me that one of those lines is about twice as big as one of the other ones, right? You can do that real easily. It's not even hard. Now, try doing that with circles. Guess what you're really bad at? Judging area. You can't do it, right? You can tell me that the circles are bigger, you can distinguish them, but you can't do comparisons on them. And then down at the very bottom, you're basically 
terrible at this, and that is deciding on the difference in shading between different colors of blue. Again, you can distinguish it, but you can't make quantitative distinctions on it. So the last little bit about why this is so important and why data visualization is like an area that we should focus on is because your pattern matching overrides your ability to make rational decisions about things, right? There are three faces up here. It is not your fault. None of these are actually faces, but your brain lies to you and tells you every single one of these is a face, right? And so this is my point, is that there are, this has huge implications to how we present data to people, because we can't hold ourselves blameless about the presentation if we know that people are going to make subconscious and pre-conscious decisions about what they see in a data visualization, and then how they immediately make decisions about what is happening in it, right? There is no way that you don't see faces there, and thus, I am responsible for having shown them to you. I can't just say, that's not a face, it's a rock, right? It doesn't matter. So, that's why I want to talk about charts and people, and why it's so important that we have at least some bit of empathy with who are the folks behind the dots. Uh, and then we need to talk a little bit about the implicit and explicit framings of those data when we show them to people. So. Critically, I need to tell you that not all charts are about people, right? Some charts are about fun things, like this, which is a uh, look at the 3D yield curve, right? Which is really great. Uh, yield curve, in case you're wondering, has to do with uh, bond prices and how expensive they are in the future, and this visualization of it is um, abstract and kind of esoteric. Uh, but it's also lovely, because it's done in three dimensions. Um, wonderful. Um, so again, not all charts are about people, but the ones that are, um, we have like an extra duty to sort of connect with the folks who are under the chart. This is arguably the best data visualization ever made by humanity. Um, <laughs> Edward Tufte, who is uh, somewhat of an expert in these things, says it's the best statistical graphic ever drawn. It unites six data sources, geography, troop size, paths, time, and temperature in post-war and pre-war Moscow, uh, right? So there's a, there's a battle that happens over here on the far right-hand side, um, and it basically tells us all of the things that we need to understand about that battle. So this is Napoleon invading Russia. He entered Russia with 442,000 soldiers. By the time he got to Moscow, he had about 100,000 left. He wandered around some abandoned ruins uh, and then escaped with barely 10,000 soldiers. 6,000 of those rejoined his army over there. Um, he never recovered from that blow and was decisively beaten at Waterloo two years later, which is pretty great. Um, but what's missing from this chart, right? Like, this tells us everything we need to know about Napoleon and his march to Russia and back. You know what's missing? Frostbite! Right? Like, you can't see why all the people are gone. Where did they go? And the truth is, they died hideous, gangrenous deaths. Right? This chart is clinical. It is cold and uncaring. It tells you literally nothing about the people who expired on this path. It does an excellent job of giving you the 30,000 foot view. It does a terrible job in inspiring empathy. And so this is something that is important because this chart, while the finest work of data visualization, uh, is still missing something. It misses the ability to connect you with the people who were involved in that thing. Um, Here's another chart which is similarly exceedingly impactful, right? It was uh, made by somebody named John Snow, who knows nothing. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, and it's an old chart, right? Um, and so this is a chart that's uh, drawn over on a map, right? Uh, and this is focused on an area in London called Broad Street. Um, it's apparent that from this view that we've got a map and a chart, right? See the little black, black lines? Those are individual things of some variety, right? Um, I'll give you a hint, it's 1840s in London, England, uh, and bad things were happening in cities around the world in the 1840s. Um, they were uh, attributed to miasma, um, which uh, meant creeping bad air. As an aside, malaria is literally a bad transliteration of the Italian term mala aria, which means bad air. Um, this is, predates the germ theory of disease, by the way, uh, by quite a bit. Uh, that there is a pump, right? And so Jon Snow graphed all the deaths in a week in London around this pump uh, and found that there were a lot of people dying. He didn't know why, but he knew that they were, right? Again, this is way predating the germ theory of disease. We still think that like bad air is what's killing people. So I want to read to you from Jon Snow himself. This is from his diary. He said, on proceeding to the spot, I found that nearly all the deaths had taken place a short distance from the Broad Street pump. There were only 10 deaths in houses situated decidedly nearer to another street pump. With the regard to those deaths occurring in the locality beyond belonging to that pump, there were 61 instances in which I was informed the deceased persons drank from pump water 
there at Broad Street. The result of the inquiry then was that there was no particular outbreak or prevalence of cholera except among persons who were in the habit of drinking at the above mentioned pump well. I had an interview with the Board of Guardians in St. James's Parish on the evening of the 7th of September and represented the above circumstances to them. In consequence of what I said, the handle of the pump was removed the following day. And guess what? It stopped the outbreak and people stopped dying of cholera in London, which is astonishing, right? So nobody understood the germ theory of disease, had no idea why it was happening, but this exceedingly primitive data visualization was sufficient to stop people from dying at like uh, unbelievable rates in downtown London. But what's missing? Those dots are still just little black boxes. They may as well be coffins, right? Like there's basically no there to this chart. There's nothing, it brings nothing else to the table except for the like clinical efficiency of uh, explaining what happened. And so there's one more of these that I'd like to show also about cholera, which is terrible. So this is the New York Daily Tribune, right? This is showing the number of people who were dying in New York City. 700 people were dying every week in New York in 1849 of cholera, which is astonishing. 700 people a week, right? So this, is, this newspaper uh, published a front page chart uh, showing the rise, progress, and decline of cholera in New York. And the reason why this chart is interesting is it's it's published in a newspaper that's owned by this man, Horace Greeley, right? That's his name right up there at the top. Uh, and that red line is the week in which his son died of cholera, right? There's nothing about that in the chart. There's no explanation. It brings no humanity to it. Uh, there are things that are basically hidden behind the chart in the data, the uh, explicit framing of it, which we would have had way more opportunity to connect with what was going on. So I suppose you can get to it now. The thing that's missing from all these charts is the people. Right? We have an excellent understanding of what's going down uh, on an abstract level, but what we're missing is um, the anecdote. Um, so in order to give you a little more uh, detail on like what the heck is going on here, I want to talk about this package of stories that ran in the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. They were called The Color of Money, uh, and they won the Pulitzer Prize for Investigative Reporting in 1989. Um, the main characters in the story is basically two groups of people, right? First group of people you have are Atlanta home buyers, people who just want to buy houses and like live their lives eating delicious grits, right? And so there are two neighborhoods that the story is about. One neighborhood is called Gresham Park, and one neighborhood is called uh, McClendon, all right? And so here are here is character one, home buyers, right? Character two. The um, evil, fantastic bank administrators and federal regulators who have wonderful names like Edward Crutchfield and Martha Seeger. So I want to talk for a little bit about a systemic problem that was occurring in Atlanta and why it was happening, right? So here are two neighborhoods, Gresham Park and McClendon. If you were a family in Atlanta who happened to be African American and you were trying to buy a house outside of certain neighborhoods, banks would mysteriously deny your loan. If you were a white family, though, you might have no similar troubles. So there was this reporter at the Atlanta Journal-Constitution who saw this showing up in the data that he had looked at and thought that this was really interesting. So he found pairs of neighborhoods that were like basically identical uh, from demographic points of view, with one exception, that they had either majority black or majority white families, and then found out that banks were systematically refusing to lend money to black families who wanted to buy in white neighborhoods. So this guy, Jim Minat, is uh, he was a bank administrator and he said, we get a bad rap. It's not like we have a map up there in the banks with all the redlined districts. So who knows what the word redlined means? Oh, good. Oh, I was gonna go explaining this. And uh, um, the part about this that's so funny is here's actually a map of Atlanta with red lines in it, right? This is <laughs> It's from 1936. It was not hanging in Jim Minat's office, but that would have certainly made the story a lot better. Um, uh, this map, by the way, so the way redlining works, in case you've forgotten, is banks would couch how they wanted to do their lending based on terms of risk, right? Because they'd say, ah, we can't lend to anybody in this neighborhood because it's hazardous, right? Um, or it's definitely declining. But then there are other neighborhoods that are still desirable and best. I'm going to let you work out briefly in your head what those are actually code for. Um, so this, from that map, is Gresham Park. It is literally redlined, right? And one might ask Jim Minette, if you weren't looking at a real redline map, but your lending practices accidentally recreated one from scratch, why is there really a difference, right? Um, and if this is the core and kernel of the story, why do all the charts in that story, aka this one, uh, focus on things like area and not focus on things like people? Why is it that we're so concerned about where these areas are and not concerned about the human beings who are trying to buy houses in them? 
So this is a frustrating thing for me. Um, this is a project that I worked on at the New York Times. It is about uh, people who were detained at Guantanamo Bay in Cuba, right? Um, it has a single dot for every human being who's ever been detained there, and uh, not mysteriously at all, there are still 40 people who live in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, um, and they can never be transferred to U.S. soil because of laws. Um, so the problem is that the dots are really people. Um, and we even had pictures and a ton of biographical information about every single person uh, who was being detained in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. But we hid all that information behind a tooltip. So if you were on your phone, you can't even see it because you don't get to hover. And if you're on a desktop computer, you have to actually move your mouse over one of those dots. And it's real finicky because they're only like a couple of, uh, you know, a couple of pixels uh, on each side. Um, so the, the problem with this is that the real narrative heft of the story is hidden uh, over here behind an abstraction layer. Um, so we're holding like these 40 people who were children and like were teenagers, they have families and lives that they were pulled away from, uh, and all that information is uh, taken and put away because it was much more interesting to the people who built this to tell the high level story than to tell the narrow one, which is frustrating to me. So what is it that we can do about this as, you know, programmers and practitioners of data, right? The first thing is I want to talk to you about the difference between explicit and implicit framings, right? So there's this tension that we have between giving a high-level overview about, um, about a topic and then zooming in on, uh, on like an anecdote, right? Or telling a narrative about individual people. Um, the color of money gets around that. They had photographers go take pictures of people in their yards, but their charts are still real dry and kind of terrible. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about data collection practices and what that means for how you frame your visualization, right? So here is an example of a visualization that is ostensibly about people. It's about crime reports in San Francisco, right? And it's from Trulia. Um, the problem with this is that um, this view of crime data is interesting because it's focused entirely on the victims of crime uh, and even more about people who have chosen to report a crime, which is a totally different data set than people who have experienced a crime, right? Nobody on this deck uh, or in this, uh, in this map uh, reported an issue with like a savings and loan scandal or a problem with corporate embezzlement or a widespread OSHA violations, right? This is all going to be property crime and like people were making noise late at night. So I want you to think carefully about what kinds of people show up in this data visualization and what kinds of crimes are reported in them, right? Very different ones than the overall kinds of crimes that necessarily affect people. Um, this is a different way of looking at the exact same kind of data. This is from the Center for Spatial Research at Columbia University, uh, and they're focusing on a slightly different angle, which is people who are being incarcerated and at what cost. Uh, which is interesting. Their project is called Million Dollar Blocks. So look at this one. This is an 11, uh, uh, this is 11 people. Um, uh, across, this is a handful of people across 11 blocks in Brooklyn. Uh, and it cost $11,839,665 to incarcerate the people in these 11 blocks, which is astonishing, right? This is a very different data set than merely looking at who are the victims of crime, right? Um, and one of the reasons why this is so interesting is because when you focus on the dollars that are behind it, it makes you think, wow, instead of focusing on putting folks in prison, what if we were focused on other things? Like, what if there were other institutional changes that we could make? It immediately takes you to a more structural understanding of what's happening, rather than one that's focused on like individual reports about whether or not someone was very, being very loud in your neighborhood at night. Um, and so that's very different, right? Uh, and this implicit change in the way that we collect and frame data totally changes what the visual means, right? No longer is this a story about who's experiencing crime. It's a story about how uh, the system affects individual human beings. Um, this is a project that I worked on at the Post very briefly. Um, it's called Fatal Force. It's about people who've been shot and killed by police. Um, instead of looking at crime as an individual act, this is looking at more of the systemic production of crime, right? Um, and our reporters wanted to ask this question. They said, how many people are killed by police in a given year? And the problem is that there is no single place where you can go find that number because there are hundreds of jurisdictions in the United States, all of whom calculate this uh, very differently from each other. Um, so we filed Freedom of Information Act requests, we hunted down previously reported data, um, and then ended up just looking in news reports uh, at stories in local, at local newspapers uh, to try to get this number and uh, put it together for every year between 2015 and present. Um, so the reason why this is interesting is because we can do a good job with that framing, right? It's, a, it's the correct collection of data, but then when we go tell the story, gray boxes, right? 
These are human beings, right? Not coffins. They had much more to their lives than just this gray box. Um, at least we gave it a shot. Down at the bottom, you know, we have like a little biographical card, which is really nice. It tells you a little bit more information about that. But I think that that makes the, the crime of visualizing it as boxes even worse because this information is available and we can't show it. Can't come up with a way to show it to people. So what is it that we want to do? What are the, what are the, what's the better way? Um, what are ways that we can do this? Um, so how do we show that empathy with the subjects of the data that we collect? Um, in this case, um, this is an excellent framing of data, but it's also a wonderful visualization of data, right? So um, uh, ProPublica wanted to visualize uh, people who were affected by uh, economic downturn. And one of the ways they decided to do it was by focusing on people who didn't get jobs that were promised by the president on the campaign trail, right? So they took a list of all the jobs that had been promised to, in various places, just like added up all the numbers and found this number um, uh, and, uh, and, they, and we visualized it here. He said that there would be 35, uh, 35 different claims uh, that companies would create around 9 million jobs, right? So each person in this visualization represents about 4,000 jobs. This is interesting, right? Both in the way that we take the data, it's about people, but also in the way we visualize the data. We show you little actual people, which is nice. Um, this is such a hard thing to do that ProPublica actually built a font that shows little human beings, right? And you can download it right now in case you would like to show this in your dashboard at work um, if you have any data that needs or you need to show off people. Um, so they made it a little easier for you to say replace the dots in your chart with uh, human beings. It's a totally good tactical solution that removes the excuse that it was way too hard for me to show you what a human being looked like. Um, and so I think I want to end around here. Um, this isn't a data visualization, but it is a unique solution to the same problem, right? How do we humanize 185 million registered US voters? So every day this bot tweets a profile of an American voter from a giant community survey. Um, it's a great low level understanding of who votes in the United States, where they live and what makes them tick. Um, so I think this broadly are the things that I kind of want you to keep in mind when you're a consumer of data visualization or when you are a practitioner who's collecting data. Um, remember for me that there are both explicit and implicit frames to what we decide to collect and how we decide to show it, and that those frames can really outstrip how your story uh, is supposed to work because it takes advantage of how your visual system works and wedges that information in there whether you want it there or not. When we show uh, visuals that are about dots, the story is less than it was when we show them with human beings. So don't forget, you have an obligation, uh, even maybe a duty to consider both how you collect and how you present data uh, and how those uh, collections and presentations are gonna affect readers. Um, so this is me, uh, that's the, the deck. Uh, if you have questions, I'll be around afterwards. <laughs>